Croeso, uh, welcome to Goyle Hub. Um, I am Kate Van Buren, the founder and director of Goyle Hub, and we're joined here today for, as part of Goyle 2021 um, with the other Welsh festivals to bring you this special day of literature programming. With me today, I have Fionn Petch, who is the senior editor at Charco Press. I can never say Charco, how you and Carolina say it. It's so nice and I can never quite get it right. Um, but he is also a translator from Spanish and French into English. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Caitlin. So I was wondering if you could start with a little bit in case people don't know, what is Charco Press and what work do you guys do? Um, so uh, Chakra Press was set up uh, four years ago now. Their first catalog was 2017. Um, and it's the range Carolina Orloff, who is uh, from Argentina. Um, and she's been living in the UK for uh, almost 20 years now uh, in Edinburgh. And uh, she saw a, a gap in the market for a press that focuses on Latin American fiction. So um, it's uh, fiction from all the 19 countries of uh, Latin America translated from Spanish and from Portuguese so far. Um, and it's it was a response, uh, I, I guess, to the you know, the, the well-known lack of translated fiction in general read in the Anglophone world. Um, but also uh, specifically to the sort of lack of uh, knowledge of the vast diversity of uh, literature within Latin America. Um, there's still a, a sense that uh, Latin America has a, a, a specific literary tradition that you know, is, uh, dates back to the to the boom generation and to magical realism and all that. And uh, everything is always sort of related to those, uh, you know, those great figures from the 60s and 70s and so on. Um, and there's relatively little awareness of how within each of the Latin American countries, which are enormously diverse amongst uh, each other, while obviously they have, you know, historical similarities. Um, you know, each of these countries has its own ecosystem of, of authors um, writing in many different genres and styles, um, responding not only to their you know, local um, history and social situations and so on, but to, to universal questions as well. So some, some of these are authors who are writing about their own countries and some of them are writing about completely different things. That's in, in short. Um, and so they're, they're Chartco um, are producing, uh, they've been doing uh, five books in their first year. And now they've gone up to six, I think it's gonna be seven uh, next year. Um, they're also um, pr promoting uh, transla uh, translators. They're, they're, um, they put the names of the translators on the front cover, which um, is something of a statement. Not all publishers do that. And uh, they're doing their best to um, seek out uh, new, uh, new translators, up and coming translators. Charka has a little bit of an unusual model there, don't they? They sort of, there's much more encouragement of co-translation. And I've noticed that um, in this stack of Charka books I have, um, I think you're credited in all of them as the editor, but then you've also done a bunch of co-translation work. I think, is it Fate? Um, Fate was, by Jorge Consiglio. I, yeah. And then the first book that you translated for Charco was Fireflies and Luis Gastes, and you've recently done a musical offering. So I was wondering what do the different roles that you play look like, um, translator, co-translator and editor? Um, what's the differences between the work you <clears> would <throat> Yeah, um, this is something that, um, I mean, I, I guess I discovered it through the, through the process. Um, uh, so 
what what Charco is st particularly strong on, I think, is uh, always working with um, editors who who know the source language as well, which, which is not 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 always the case um, with other publishers. So. Um, rather than having the, the translator being the, the only person who has access to the, the source text, um, the, the, the editor is also reading them in parallel. They're reading the Spanish and the, and the English, and they're working more, more closely with the, with the translator. And you know, it, it varies from, from, from case to case. Um, and every text is different, and they present their own difficulties. Sometimes, um, as editor, you, you you find you know there's there's very little to do really. <laughs> um, the translator has has got the text. They've got they found the voice, um, and all you have to do is you know dot some eyes and cross some keys and, and maybe you know. Honestly, I I I've just finished editing a, a text by uh, Annie McDermott, who's one of the regular. Translators who works with uh, Charco, she translates from Spanish and uh, Portuguese, and um, she she is also edited for for Charco um, in the past. Um, and I said to her, you know, I've <laughs> I've I've found almost nothing to to comment on or or suggest in in this text because um, she you know she she just done such a such a great job with it. Um, and then other other times, um, you know, largely because a text um, is very complex, uses very difficult language, um, it's much more collaborative. Um, and there's, you know, endless rounds of back and forth between the translator and, and the editor trying to resolve specific um, you know, challenges, trying to find solutions for, you know, possibly intractable translation problems. <laughs> and then as a, as a co-translator, it's slightly different. Um, I mean, I've, I've only done one so far, uh, one I did with, with Carolina. Um, there, it, you know, I can only really speak for, for that one because I, again, I think the process is different every time. But, you know, because you know, even though Carolina has lived in the UK for for twenty years, um, her English is not native. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, yeah. So we we work together on that text because she she has a, you could say, a greater insight into the, the text as an Argentinian. Um, it's you know, Jorge Concilio, the author of Fate, is is uh, from Buenos Aires. Um, so yeah, there, there, as I say, it's a different process each time. It's very hard to generalize. <laughs> yeah, I think I've read elsewhere that you said that there is, um, you know, you think that each book is so different that there is no theory you can come to translation world. And yeah. I mm -hmm. built a theory out of there not being a theory. And I thought it was very um, apt. That's right. I mean, and that's, um, yeah, it's it's hard to. Um, I'm I'm somebody uh, who's perhaps had a slightly odd route into uh, translation, uh, translating literature specifically because I I never really studied translation. Uh, these days, I think it's more uh, common uh, for people to uh, perhaps do uh, a master's in translation or a summer school or something like that, and. That's, I think they um, are probably great at um, sort of fast tracking you on some of the challenges that you face and um, giving you a greater insight into the, the tools you need to use and to different approaches. Um, I don't think they can necessarily make you a better translator as such. Um, the only the only thing that makes you a good translator is uh, you know experience <laughs> and doing it a lot, reading a lot of of different kinds of text. I guess.
I noticed um, so you've mentioned previously that you did some interpreting and often translators don't like to do or don't um, find that they're one one aspect of translating suits their skill sets and you know I think Polly Burton last year said oh I, I hate interpreting like it just you know it fills her with anxiety whenever she's called upon to do it in a moment and I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that and how what a few more details about your route into translation were there any pivotal texts or moments that sent you on your way sure absolutely yeah um well just first about in interpreting um yeah, only once have I found myself uh, shoved into uh, a booth, you know, where you're doing simultaneous translation with it with a headset and so on, and never again. It, it was uh, an awful. It was just like they needed somebody in that moment. I'd never trained for it. I was at a, a film festival at the time, and it was an awful experience. Um, I have done, um, you know, my, among my early translation experience was uh, doing consecutive interpreting um for film festivals i did that for um, many years when i lived in mexico city or well, in um in mexico and that uh, that was very interesting it's slightly different because you're you're listening to what somebody says and then you're um producing it in english after they've finished um i think it's a very particular um and extraordinary skill set skill set to have to do it simultaneous simultaneously simultaneous translation really is something um very complex and it requires a lot of training and a lot of um repetition and a lot of uh research of the of the subject you know a lot of preparation um and it's yeah you, you need to have a particular kind of brain uh, to do that and, and i don't um so, <laughs> um my first uh, sort of encounter with translation, of, apart from the fact that I read a lot of translated fiction growing up, and uh, like a lot of people, I guess, uh, never really thought about it much, never thought about it as translated fiction. I just, you know, I read a lot of fiction from around the world, just because it's what I came across. Um, probably the first time I thought about translation was while I was doing my degree. Um, I studied at philosophy at York University and I did an optional subject or whatever they're called. Uh, in the English department, I did one on modern Italian narrative. Um, so that was 20th century Italian authors. And we read them in Italian. Um, and we uh, translated short sections. So I remember translating, you know, like a couple of this, the invisible cities of Italy. Italo Calvino, um, uh, you know, fragments of Natalia Ginsburg and Matteo Siloni. And, um, uh, and I just remember loving it and being fascinated by it. And then uh, I never saw it as a, a career. I, I never had a very clear idea of what I wanted to do as a career. And I was just thinking today that perhaps that is one reason that translation um became my profession in the end because i was always uh somebody attracted by both the sciences by the arts um, and you know fascinated by so many things that i was never able to specialize in one you know i, I see people all the time who are just so clearly fascinated by you know meteorites or standing stones or you know finding a solution to such a, such a problem and they dedicate their whole careers to this subject and i've always been a generalist in that sense and i guess in a way specializing in translation allows you to continue to be a generalist because you're always having to find out new things about about the world um especially um, you know, because I, I'm, I'm not only a literary translator, there's no way I could make a living just as a literary translator. Um, I began translating uh, already 10, 15 years ago now um, when I was living in Mexico City. And I started uh, so that I could survive, basically. It was a way of making a living. And I began translating uh, academic texts, 
um, journalism, touristic texts. And I, uh, through people I knew in Mexico City, I began working particularly with uh, museums and with um, yeah, ma magazines. And so I've come to specialize in uh, art and architecture. Um, but yeah, what, what I love about translation, you know, generally speaking, is this, you know, lack of specialization in the sense that you're, you know, every day is you're, you're having to research something completely new. And for that, you know, the period that you're working with this particular text, you become a specialist in that area because you have to burrow very deep into the vocabulary of that, um, you know, whatever, whatever uh, the particular article or text or uh, book that you're working on is, is about. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's like, you know, in English, I wouldn't have the vocabulary to talk about some topics. So it's, <laughs> I can completely see how that um, mm. is no different. Um, I wondered if you could talk next a little bit about um, so Charco started because Carolina is Argentinian with um, I think their first round was certainly all Argentinian books and a lot of sort of you know the standards but the personal favourite of mine is The Wind That Laid Waste um, mm -hmm. are very Argentinian and I was wondering if you could talk about I know you visited Argentina and um, with a little bit of a specific interest in um, Gaiman and Port Mudrin and, and the Welsh communities there given that we are here talking about um, Wales and a Welsh day um, I wondered if you could talk about your trip there. Yes of course um... Yeah, as you said, the, the first uh, catalogue of uh, Charco, I think all, all, for, all five books were from Argentina, and that, that was something of a statement um, to, to show the, the diversity, as I, as I said earlier, um, of, of writing, and of contemporary writing from you know, just one country. Um, so I first went to uh, Argentina uh, when I was 19 years old, um, I won't say in what year that was. Um, <laughs> and I went there uh, largely because of two books. Uh, one of them was Bruce Chatwin's In Patagonia. Got it right here. Got it you've got, oh, you put it there. Yes. It might come up. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Which uh, I guess I, I read in my, in my mid teens. I don't quite remember how I came across it, but um, I read that and I read a lot of other Chatwin as well. And I guess, I don't know how well known you, um, I think you're slightly younger than me, um, would would consider Chatwin these days, but it's, yeah. it, it, I think, I think it's, um, it's a curious thing, but in the 80s, he was this hugely well-known writer. And perhaps his star has uh, faded a little these days. I think his books are all still in print, but um, I went to uh, our local uh, English language bookshop uh, here in Berlin. Here the bookshops are open as essential uh, uh, stores. Uh, and was surprised by how little Chatwin uh, there was. In fact, I think there was only a copy of On the Black Hill. Um, but he was a hugely best-selling and fashionable author in the, in the 80s. And his first, um, well, his first book was uh, In Patagonia, which was published in uh, 1977. And that was what sort of shot him to fame. And uh, well, I'll talk about that in a sec, but the other book that, and I think even but it led me to want to make a journey uh, across Patagonia, which I did, was one by an Italian writer called Claudio Magris, and I've got it here. It's called um, Un altro mare, A Different Sea. 
And so this was one of those books that I'd read in translation as a, as a teenager. Um, and it's about um, a young Italian, um, he's 20 or something, when, who leaves Italy for Patagonia and, and goes and lives in solitude in a sort of gaucho lifestyle on the pampas of Argentina. Um, and that book by Magris is actually about a real young philosopher called Carlo Michelsteiter, uh, who became very important to me later um, as I studied philosophy. He wrote a book, um, which was actually his uh, thesis called Persuasion and Rhetoric. And that later, much later, became the um, one of the main focuses of my uh, PhD thesis. And in fact, my very first experience of trying to translate something myself was trying to translate this, um, you know, almost completely forgotten uh, text called Persuasion and Rhetoric. I should say this uh, was 1910, we're talking about, um, that this uh, Carlo Michelsteiter uh, wrote this uh, book and it had never been published in English. Um, in fact, it was almost completely forgotten until uh, Magris wrote this book about him. Um, and so I uh, remember sitting in the li library at York University trying, you know, with a huge dictionary, my Italian was fairly rudimentary, you know, trying to make sense of this very, very difficult uh, book. Got it here. Um, this, uh, Hard enough without putting it into Italian. Yeah. <laughs> la persuasione e la rhetorica, that was the copy I had at that time. Um, and so these two sort of books of uh, travelers' tales, I guess, were what led me to, um, I went to, to Chile and I got a bike. I bought a bike in Santiago. And uh, I decided I was going to make a journey from the Pacific coast to the Atlantic coast along the northern edge of Patagonia, which is the, well, in, in Argentina, that's considered to be the Rio Negro. It's the sort of the frontier uh, between two provinces. Um, it's the northern frontier of the province of Chubut, which is the province where the, the Welsh settlers um, arrived. Um, and so I spent a month uh, on my bike uh, crossing uh, from the Chilean coast uh, over the Cordillera de los Andes and down across the, you know, the vast flat steppes of, of Patagonia and ended up in Bahia Blanca. Um, and well, curiously enough, 20 years later, I would find myself translating Luis Sagasti. And Luis Sagasti is an author who lives in Bahia Blanca. Um, so coincidences. And I then, I left my bike in Buenos Aires and I then went and did another I think, couple of months traveling around Patagonia. I went to um, Puerto Madryn, which is the, the port where the uh, Welsh settlers arrived. And then I went uh, to Gaiman. And just, I think it was just a day trip that I made to Gaiman and it was you know, just quite in, in tourism mode. Um, and I had a, yeah, the famous Welsh tea. Tea, <laughs> tea and tea bread in one of the old houses. And it was wonderful. Or breath, it's called. Um, yeah, no, exactly. I've seen photos of these tea houses. It's um, it's really interesting. It's very like um, I don't know if you would agree with the statement. I'm um, sorry, <laughs> the scrap metal <laughs> track driven by. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you would agree with the statement, but I thought from Chatwin's work and also from sort of more modern accounts, um, that 
names and language last in a way that sort of knowledge doesn't and um, so sort of the name the Welsh names and the Welsh language stays whereas very much in Chatwin's book they have the communities don't understand the geography of Wales or they don't understand you know there are all these errors mm. that they make but so I thought that was really interesting that mm. um, knowledge because it's not relevant to their lives you know there's no reason for them to hold on to that knowledge but the names and language remain that's that's very interesting yes um yeah it's i mean the whole i was just rereading re um you know the, the history of how how they came to be there and so on and what one thing that struck me was i was looking at um satellite photographs of of gaiman and how ex you know, what an extraordinary landscape it is um, because just around Trelew and Gaiman, which are the, the, the two main Welsh, Welsh settlements, there is this strip of extraordinary green, which they've fertilized, uh, fertilized, irrigated around the river, um, the Tribute River. But all around that, you just see this, you know, endless vast swathe of, you know, gray, drab, brown desert, which is what was there when they arrived but um so you know they, they faced a very very harsh first few years and I mean, a lot of them gave up a lot of them went back to Wales and so on but the other thing that struck me about the um the, from you know the satellite imagery was the how the whole land surface is divided into absolute geometric um squares as, as you see, you know, fly, if, you, if, you're in a, if you're in a plane flying over a lot of parts of the Americas, in fact, particularly over the United States, and everything is rigidly divided into these squares. And just how different that landscape is to the fields of Wales, of course, you know, the fields and the valleys and, and the, you know, everything is very organically shaped. And so to see this, you know, artificially irrigated landscape and so rigidly cut up into squares is quite it's quite a sight and the uh, yeah the, the way that the the language has been preserved isn't it i mean it seems to be still doing um still still going strong you know in, in a way you know there are still bilingual schools in gaiman and trevelin and the number of uh welsh speakers is i think around five thousand or I'd read 25,000. Yeah. Um, but either which way, to or, be honest, it's quite impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, certainly for, um, I think um, we might, um, I'd read something about those first few years too. And I thought it was very interesting that um, as with so many sort of uh, colonial um, movements of people that um, the Welsh were moving to Patagonia in an attempt to preserve culture and mm -hmm. um, language that was they felt was under attack and also in doing so they were moving into a area of the country that had already its language and culture and it's, it's mm -hmm. a very um it's a very typical story of american colonialism um mm -hmm. yeah and um it's such a tension isn't it like um forget where exactly I was going with this question. I had a few different elements to it. Like one element to it was that um, uh, Chatwin in his stories of all these different people in Patagonia, I feel does neglect he interacts with a lot of indigenous people, but he doesn't center them in the way that he centered mm -hmm. the Welsh communities living there or um, Butch Cassidy and the sort of stories of crime. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then yeah, also that, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, well, it's it is interesting that the yeah it, that firstly that I mean it, it wasn't a an, an attempt to create a a, a Welsh um, um, I, I, I guess uh, a, a colony in the sense of that that would be a, a, how, how would you say. Under the a, a, a colonial nation that would still be under the control of Wales. It, they, 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 you know, obviously it, it was ceded to them by, by um, the Argentinian government and, and they were able to claim the land in, in cooperation with the um, Argentinian government. And in fact, um, 
you know, re reading about you know the people that they were dealing with, like uh, General Roca. Um, at the time, he is now famous for um, and reviled as the, um, the you know, for what's known as the conquest of the desert, um, which was effectively the you know, extermination or neo genocide of the indigenous people. And it was, um, although it was a very harsh and inhospitable land, and it was very um, sparsely populated, it was populated. Um, by, in that area by the Tewelche um, people. And it, uh, the history suggests that it was in fact, uh, thanks to the help of the uh, local people that the, the Welsh settlers were able to survive um, because they offered them um, know-how and, and assistance. Um, so yeah, it, it is one of those, as you say, uh, very odd colonial adventures. And, and I think what's distinctive about it in, in the Argentinian context perhaps is that um, it remains such a um, kind of well-identified community. Because I was asking, I, I spoke to uh, Luis Agasti, um, the author I've translated um, the other day, and I was asking him, you know, what what does the the Welsh settlement mean to him? And, and he was like, well, you know, they're they're they are one of so many um, groups who who came to Argentina because um, obviously it is a, a nation made up of of settlers from so very many countries, and you know, it's it's dominated by Italian uh, by Italian immigrants um, and. Obviously, there are people from uh, from you know, every part of of Europe and also from from the Middle East. Um, one uh, curious discovery I made when I moved to Berlin is that it's very easy to find um, what I regularly drink is mate. Um, it's very easy to find uh, yerba mate, which is the kind of tea which is you know, typically drunk in uh, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay. Um, I became addicted to it ever since I visited there. Um, it's very easy to find here in Berlin because of the number of Syrian immigrants to Germany, because they were also, you know, 100 years ago, a great number of Syrian immigrants to Argentina. And they also, began to drink mate and they took mate drinking to uh, Syria. And so now you can go into an Arabic store here and you can find mate. And it's, you know, it, on the container, it, it says packaged in Syria. Even though it's, it's, you know, it's still grown in Argentina, in the north of Argentina. <laughs> Funny enough, I'd come across Marte as I think originating in the Berlin club scene and then moving to the UK as sort of the drink of choice if you want to stay up all night. Um, because sure. it's not quite coffee. But there, there it's as a, as a soft drink, right? Yes. It's like, like a, a kind of so soda, yeah. It comes in bottle, yeah. You see it, you know, all, all the kids drink it here. It's a kind of mate infused soft drink, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So it's so nice that it's got this much more <laughs> meaningful origin <laughs> not that clubby isn't in its own way meaningful but yeah i really like that story <laughs> um in argentina in particular are there um i'm quite curious about sort of dialects and the specificities of argentinian spanish as opposed to other spanish that you might translate from latin america um are there any sort of technicalities you enjoy <laughs> um it's uh it depends again that's <laughs> you could give that answer to any any question about um translation it depends from book to book doesn't it um i uh yeah what, one thing you need to understand about spanish is that it is very different in each in each country although it is always going to be mutually intelligible the the slang is uh vastly different from from country to country Argentina is distinctive, 
along with some of the Central American countries is uh, that they use VOS uh, for the uh, first person you, uh, sorry, first person, uh, you singular, the singular you um, address, uh, they use BOSS and so the, the verbs are uh, declined slightly differently. So, um, and I don't know, the, the, the recent book by Selva Almada that's um, that coming out this year with, um, with Charco, it's called Ladrilleros, Brickmakers. Um, it's translated by Annie McDermott and I've edited it and uh, that book, uh, much more than her previous books, uh, which um, are The Wind That Lays Waste, which is one of my absolute favorites, uh, absolute extraordinary book, um, and Dead Girls, which um, is much more journalistic book. Um, uh, which was published last year by Charco. Um, so uh, Brickmakers um, is very involved slang, and and it's you know, it's not just Argentinian slang. It's it's slang from uh, you know, cent center north of the country. You know because you know just like in uh, the UK, the, the slang is enormously different from area to area as well. So that that presented a lot of uh, problems in how to and how to you know, preserve that and you know the, the decisions that you have to make about whether to leave some words in the original from time to time and th there we also faced a whole another issue because um, it was be it's being published uh, in the United States by uh, Grey Wolf Press and so it had to be I mean, it, it's always an issue because you know the, the books that aren't co-publications are Charco also distributes in, in the US. You you always have to think about you know who is your English reader. You can't just assume that it is you know a um, um, a reader in the UK for, for a start. You know, so um, complexity to that, like this. Yeah. So translations that you know like there have been translations that are american translations and english translations aren't it like yeah 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 it, it is an endlessly uh, complex question and, and one that is full of full of compromises um i think you know with with my sagasti translations um they are there are books that are are not uh, specifically lo located in, in Argentina. Sometimes there are specific sections that take place in Argentina, um, but and, and his writing is much more. Well, it's uh, deceivingly, uh, deceptively uh, standard Spanish, until it's not, and then I only realize later that he's used a word that is specific to Argentina. And despite my every effort, I haven't um, I haven't spotted it, and that's uh, you know it, it, it's a constant challenge with, with with translating a text that, however much you look into um, a, you know, a sentence a word, um, you can never be you know. I, th I think if if you have the slightest suspicion that there's something else going on in a line that the, you, you haven't got it hundred percent. You have to really uh, go um, above and beyond to, to look for alternative interpretations. There was just one line in, in a musical offering that he used the word potrero, which I used the standard uh, translation of it, which is um, a pasture like, you know, where a horse would graze, yeah? Um, and it made absolutely perfect sense in the context, but I hadn't realized that in Argentina, potrero can mean an improvised football pitch, that very specific meaning. And so in this case, it was, it was that meaning, even though, the, you know, the, the standard meaning was, you know, perfectly apt for the context. So anyway, Second, uh, second printing will have that um, fixed. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sometimes people who aren't in the industry don't realise is that each printing is not necessarily identical um, in and of itself. Yeah, 
<laughs> so just to, to wrap up what are you working on at the moment and is there anything you'd sort of like to plug and talk about um well um at the moment i am working on the the prequel to the other um big book that i've published with charco press is um renato cisneros um the distance between us and uh, renato is from peru this was a huge bestseller in, in Peru. Um, and his uh, uh, prequel will uh, come out uh, next year with, with Charco Press. So I'm working on that now. Um, and, <clears throat> and apart from that, I'm, I'm, I'm working to, to edit the uh, most of the rest of the of the Charco catalog, and I think they, they have a very um, exciting uh, bunch of books coming up next year. A lot, a lot of uh, a lot of new authors uh, they, they haven't seen before from some new countries as well. Because th there's a lot of countries to cover, and they still haven't covered um, every uh, Latin American country. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, I love what Charco does, and I love that it, um, you guys publish such experimental fiction um you know and i think it's um great the work you do and thank you so much for talking to me um, we really appreciate it uh, thank you very much thank you caitlin it's a pleasure <laughs> Um, and if anyone wants to see more of the rest of today, um, you can find us at goyle.org, that's G-W-Y-L.org, or at Goyle Half um, on social media and on YouTube. Um, so see you all later. Thanks.